Hey, it's William McComb, social worker, chemical dependency counselor, with another video in our ongoing series answering the most common questions and discussing some of the most common themes that we hear around the clinic. And today I'm going to talk about triggers. Triggers, I think most people are comfortable with the idea, you know, that triggers are something that reminds the person in recovery of their old lifestyle and drugs, but we're gonna dig a little bit deeper and look at how these triggers are formed and then give some idea about what you can do to better manage them. So a trigger really can be, you know, anything, again, that reminds the person in recovery of their old lifestyle. It can be that traditional uh, people, places, things, uh, but it can also be states of mind uh, or, um, you know, uh, old thoughts or things they, they hear on the radio, smells. It can really be any number of things that the person associates with their old lifestyle. So when we look at how triggers are formed, you know, I think it's important to go back and look at a famous experiment uh, by a man named Pavlov. He was a Russian scientist, late 1800s, early 1900s, and he did a series of experiments with dogs where he would ring a bell and then feed his dog. So he was conditioning the dogs to respond to the bell. So again, he rings the bell, feeds the dog, ring the bell, feed the dog, and in time, again, they associate. And I think most people could see, yeah, I could train my dog if I ring the bell that it's time to eat. But what Pavlov noticed that he could ring the bell and then even if he didn't give the food, that the dog's mouths would water, that they would salivate. So they were being conditioned to respond to the bell and their bodies were physically preparing to receive the food even um, you know, in the absence of the food. So how does this relate to addiction? You know, think about the cigarette smoker, I think is a really good example. When a person who smokes, if you know, if you smoke or you know someone who smokes, you'll notice this in them, they have these ritual cigarettes throughout the day. Cigarettes that they've paired with other activities. A cigarette smoker gets in the car, and what's the first thing they do? Light up a cigarette, right? Uh, they get a cup of coffee, cigarette. Uh, after they eat, cigarette. And so you can see what's happening here is that there's an association being created between the activity, getting in the car, and the reward, which is the cigarette. And so doing this over time creates a pattern uh, that when you get in the car, if you're a smoker and you get in the car and you don't light up a cigarette, your body has already started to prepare for that cigarette, it's anticipating the cigarette, and it's creating that trigger uh, moment that has the potential to lead to a craving. So then in the course of treating uh, addiction, it's important for the person, the individual in treatment, to identify their triggers. Because just like in the, in the Pavlov experiment, what we need to happen is for the bell to ring, right, but the mouths not to water. And so if you were given that task, right, uh, you were given Pavlov's dogs and said, hey, I need you now to be able to ring the bell and their mouths no longer water, no longer respond to the cue. You know, what would you do? And probably the most uh, helpful thing would be to replace the cue happens, the bell rings, but instead of the food, maybe we do something else. You ring the bell, give the, ball a, give the dog a ball. You know, ring the bell, give the dog a ball. And over time, you can create a new association. Um, and that becomes an important thing for people in recovery to do, to recognize what their triggers are. And instead of fulfilling them with drugs or the wrong choice, they need to learn to make new associations, new patterns, new habits in their lives so that, so that they're not being triggered back into drug use or into old um, lifestyle choices and behavior patterns that have gotten them in trouble uh, in the past. So triggers lead to cravings, cravings lead to drugs ultimately, and the drugs lead to relapse. And so what we need to do 
uh, as people in recovery is we need to interrupt this chain somewhere along the line. And when you look at uh, medication, medically assisted treatment, things like Suboxone, um, when those are appropriate for, for a person, they interrupt this chain, this chain of triggers to cravings, uh, to drugs, to relapse. What happens with Suboxone, because it manages craving, and it also creates a, a, a blocker, it, it minimizes the person's response to the trigger, and it gives them time to make a better decision. Uh, if you are triggered, and then that leads to a craving, if the craving is just this big instead of this big, it's much easier to deal with, and that's something that Suboxone does. Remember, too, that with the blocker in Suboxone, the, the person knows they're not going to get the reward. If they went and, and got the, the heroin or, or the oxycodone or what have you, it, it, upon, you know, upon using it, it wouldn't get them high. And so the reward also wouldn't be there. And so it breaks this chain of, of cue and response and gives the person in recovery an opportunity to make a better choice and to develop new patterns and new habits that can better sustain uh, a healthy lifestyle.